fourth lunch and learn colloquium. This event is hosted by the Sean Bob Family Center and Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy. Our mission as partners is to improve children's well-being through research, practice, and policy. Um, we support high-quality research with children and families enrolled at the School for Early Learning um, at the Sean Bob Family Center in Wyoming Park. And um, if you're interested in conducting research with us, we have some flyers in the back at the table back there that tell you more about how to apply um, and what all that entails, or you can see me afterwards for more information. Um, our next lunch and learn will be November 1st. We'll learn about connecting early childhood with um, math and social justice um, using video and apps. Our presenter will be um, Theodore Chow, assistant professor of teaching and learning in the College of Education. We have some surveys on the table. If there's not one in front of you, please find one and complete it before you leave. Um, we do review these and we use them to help plan future workshops. Um, and it's very important to us to be able to offer you workshops that you find of value. Our presenter this afternoon is Dr. Ludmila Isurin, and I hope I said that yes. right. Um, <laughs> she's an associate professor um, of second language acquisition in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, She's an interdisciplinary scholar, and her research encompasses psycho and social sociolinguistics, social sciences, yeah. and humanities. And she is the author and co-editor of five books and numerous chapters and journal articles, including an award-winning article in language learning. She's also a faculty affiliate of the OSU Center for Cognitive and Brain Sciences. Thanks for sharing your time with us today. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, does the mic work? Okay. Uh, so in this talk, I will be sharing with you, uh, I, in my view, fascinating studies on adoptees and uh, whether those adoptees still have memories of the language uh, that uh, they were exposed to, even sometimes without speaking the language before their adoption. Some of the studies were conducted by myself, so, but I will be giving you a broader overview of the research done in this area. So we all know that uh, as soon as we move to a different country, we start losing control of our first language. It happens both to adults and to children. And there is numerous research on uh, language change or first language attrition, as they call, uh, among adults who move to a new environment. But also, there are case studies on bilingual children. Very often, those children also you know, happen to be children of immigrants. And so those children show very dramatic and fast change in their first language as soon as they move to a new country and start uh, learning a second language. But also, there are a few case studies on adoptees on those children who were adopted uh, by English-speaking uh, families. And so there are not that many studies like this, and I will uh, talk a little bit about two studies that uh, at least you know, I'm familiar with. So findings in all those studies shows that uh, L1 dramatically changes, and especially in cases of abrupt immersion in uh, L2-speaking environment. Uh, in one of the early studies that I conducted, that was part of my dissertation uh, project, it was a study on uh, a Russian-speaking girl who was nine years old at the time when an American family adopted her. The child did not speak any English. Her parents did not speak a word in Russian. So they asked me to work uh, to function as a liaison between the, the girl and the family. And uh, I got very excited because I was in grad school and at this time I was really interested in studying language loss and it was really a great opportunity for me. So I asked the parents for permission to study her language loss and acquisition. So I conducted numerous studies over 13 months monitoring and testing her. I wanted to see whether there is any correlation between her forgetting of Russian and learning English. So what I found was that, first of all, there is a correlation between L1 attrition and L2 acquisition. So what happened, high-frequency words that she was learning in English were immediately lost in Russian. So uh, in a way, it falls into one of those uh, psychological constraints known as mutual exclusivity, where children have a problem to accept two labels for one concept. 
And probably there was a competition of those labels in her mind, and so you know, she immediately claimed that she forgot the name in Russian as soon as she learned it in English. I called it semantic overlap, and later I tested it in experimental simulated study, and it showed, yes, when we have this semantic overlap, we are more likely to forget words. So also she had a trouble with cognates, those words that were pretty much the same in both languages, like flag in English and flag in Russian. And she could not probably understand that uh, words can be almost the same in two languages, and she would claim that she doesn't know this word in, in, uh, in Russian. Uh, so also she had a problem with semantically convergent pairs, like clock and watch, for example, in English. Uh, we have two different words in English, but we have only one same word f in Russian. Or for stairs and ladder, we have the two different words in Russian, we have the same. And so she had a problem as soon as she learned, for example, watch, she would not uh, know that this is the, you know, that uh, there is a word in Russian for this. She would claim that she does not know the word, and she would only retain the word for uh, another uh, pair. So comprehension, by the end of the 13th month, comprehension was no longer intact. And three years later, when I had a chance to talk to her over the phone, she was at this time 12 years old, I asked her in Russian, do you still remember Russian? There was a very long pause, and then she said, yeah, but not that I can speak it. So that was really you know, interesting, but at this time I did not study her anymore. So there was another study done uh, on uh, a child adopted uh, from uh, China by a Canadian English-speaking mother. The girl was 17 months old, and so mostly researchers wanted to see how switch to a different language happens. So they conducted a series of observational sessions in Cantonese and English. And uh, what they found that there was a very fast pace of English acquisition and Cantonese loss. And by the fourth session, a month after the study began, the child no longer showed any signs of understanding of the contextualized Cantonese. So also there was a psychological study on adoptees, on international adop adoptees, showing that uh, at what uh, age it's better to adopt children. So there were 175 Korean adoptees to the US, adopted at various ages. So there were self-reports on English uh, difficulties, and the older the child was at the time of adoption, the more severe the language difficulties were. And they concluded if two word sentences are developed by 18 months, it would be advantageous for the parents to adopt the infant before the 18 month period to facilitate the development of language. They didn't explain why they chose the two-word stage as the critical point in language acquisition. So then there was a report based on uh, accumulated psychological um, practice by Boris Gindis in New York. So what he reported was that there is a dramatic language loss in adoptees of three, four years of age. Expressive language is only just emerging or maybe weak and delayed in this group of children and abrupt immersion in an English-speaking environment leads to the reduction of the L1 linguistic skills to a practically non-functional level. Expressive language skills will deteriorate greatly in three months for a six-year-old adoptee, whereas receptive language may stay intact for longer. And within six months to a year, all functional use of the native language will disappear. Although this report was uh, not based on linguistic studies, so it was not clear how the, he came at those very definitive uh, you know, timelines, uh, but this is what uh, you know, he published in 2005. So we know that whatever we learned, whether it was the language, whether it was physics in school, math, chemistry, and we claim that we no longer remember this knowledge. It's not true, because this knowledge left some traces in our memory, and that what happens, the relearning of this material is going to be easier for you than learning it uh, from the beginning. And for the first time, this idea was proposed by uh, the father, the founding father of experimental psychology, Ebbinghaus, in the 19th century. He provided the first documented scientific evidence 
of memory retention, repetition effect, forgetting, and savings effect. As in many cases in uh, early stages of psychology, he experimented on himself. He served as the only ex you know, participant in his own study. And so he found that the increased repetition during a period of study provided savings in relearning that information at the latest time. So this idea was further developed and uh, the research on memory traces took a, a few different directions. The first one was using age regression hypnosis and L1 recovery. So age regression technique, uh, it, uh, it is based on the idea that uh, the experimenter, the practitioner, has to bring mental images to the mind of an individual, and participant is asked to describe those. So the aim is to, for the individual uh, to produce speech in the suppressed language, when the individual is regressed to a certain age when they believe the individual was speaking that language. A participant for such a study first is tested for hypnotic responsiveness and ideally should be highly hypnotizable. I think I would never be a good participant for such a study because I remain rather skeptical about hypnosis. But uh, <laughs> hypnosis often is not recognized as a valid scientific method and there are only three studies reported in literature, but I think it's still fascinating to look at those three studies. So the first one, the first one was done by S in 1962. So the participant was an 18-year-old male student born in Finland to speak, uh, Swedish speaking parents and speaking only English since the age of eight. His parents divorced when he was five. The mother moved him to the US where she remarried and her husband was American, English speaking American, so Swedish stopped being used in the house since he was 18. So he claimed that he was not speaking any uh, Swedish, that he doesn't remember any Swedish, but when he was regressed to the age when he spoke Swedish, he could uh, communicate in that language. Another study, also one of the earliest studies, comes from 1970. There was a 26-year-old student of Japanese descent. He claimed no knowledge of Japanese. The researcher did not know anything about his background. When he was regressed to three years of age, he broke into rapid Japanese. When progressed to age seven, he reverted to English. It turned out uh, he, in his early childhood, he spent early childhood, I'm sorry for the typo, uh, in uh, an internment camp for Japanese Americans. He never told this information, so you know, it was really um, fascinating for the, uh, for the uh, practitioner to find this. And one of the latest studies was done on a 21-year-old male student born and raised in Paris. He spent two years in his early life in Togo, where he spoke Mina. So there were six sessions. At the end of each session, and while still in the hypnotic state, he directly was instructed to forget everything that he had remembered during the session. Yet, he has improved the performance by the sixth uh, session. So all those studies show that the participant did not remember anything outside of the hypnotic stage, uh, session. Also, studies on bilingual aphasia report, reported by Michael Paradi showed that um, uh, patients, bilingual patients, they revealed traces of the childhood language when they were going through aphasia. So now we have two different directions. How scientifically you can tap into residual memory for the lost language. The first one is studies on the savings effect for a lost language. And another one uh, studies employing the savings paradigm. So they're different in terms of their methodological approach. So first I will be talking about studies on the savings effect outside of the savings paradigm, and then I'll give you a few examples of studies on savings paradigm. So here we have two different sets of studies. One set uh, was done on childhood overhearers. Those are children, not necessarily adoptees. Those who in their childhood were exposed to the language and often not even speaking the language, but they were surrounded by this language. They heard it. And another set of studies will be just done on adoptees. So uh, childhood of hearers versus late L2 learners were compared and the language was Hindi. 
and the effect was found for overhearers. Then in 1997, there was a study done on college language learners of Korean and Spanish. And the question that they pursued was, will early exposure to the target language, even if the young children did not speak the language, facilitate its learning later in life? And the answer was yes, after you know, they explored it. Another study, and you can see you know, there, are, there are a few researchers who uh, repeatedly mentioned in different studies because they really you know, just spent much time on exploring this phenomenon. So phonology and morphosyntax was compared in, uh, again, you know, in the Korean adoptees, uh, not adoptees, over here. So then we have a study on childhood uh, speakers versus childhood overhearers and late El Chulionis, again, you know, by Ao and her colleagues. So the tasks used in all those studies were acoustic measurements, phonological measurements, phonemic perception production, morphosyntactic production, accent rating, grammaticality judgment, and so on. And findings, childhood overhearers had a clear advantage, even if they did not speak the language. So now there was uh, an interesting study done uh, by Baus and his colleagues in 2009. They had seven adults who at some point in their childhood knew either Hindi or Zulu, but never used the language in their everyday life since then. In those languages, phoneme contrasts are usually difficult for a native speaker of English. So initially, participants did not show any preserved knowledge for their childhood languages. The effort could be found only after 15, 20 sessions. So the authors concluded the preserved implicit knowledge of one's lost language, now practiced and relearned, could not easily be detected by less robust or less intrusive behaviors measurements. Measures. So choice of tasks. Why is there so much focus on phonemic contrast in, studying, uh, in studies on adoptees or in studies on uh, savings effects for a lost language. Uh, in literature, we know that language acquisition research has demonstrated that the attunement to the phonemes of the native language takes place during the first year of life. At the age of 10, 12 months, infants are already less sensitive to non-native phonetic contrast than to native contrast. And why Korean adoptees? You have to remember that those participants whom they studied in most of those uh, publications and studies, they were adults. So if we look at 1988, uh, National Committee for Adoption reported that half of the transracial adoptions in the United States comprised predominantly Korean children adopted by white Americans. Adoptions from China, from post-Soviet bloc, they started much later and probably already in 1990s, so those still need to be you know, studied by future scholars. And so now we turn to studies on adoptees. So here again, we have adult adoptees from Korea and novice learners of Korean as L2, phoneme perception. They showed advantage, adoptees who never learned Korean. Another study, which is still forthcoming, adult adoptees from Korea who were taking Korean classes in college and a group of adult adoptees from Korea who had never taken any classes in Korean. It was done on phoneme uh, perception. Another study, again, you know, on adoptees, but this time it's from India, and adopted at the age of two on average, were tested at the age of 12. I have to bring your attention to the fact that those were not tested when they were adults. They were tested 10 years after they were adopted. And adoptees significantly improved in perceptual discrimination of the, over the control group after minimal training. So one of the most fascinating findings concerns prelinguistic infants. So those who never said a word in their language before adoption. They were adopted, brought to a different country, and the question is, do we have any savings effects just you know, from the exposure to the language without you know, uh, having any production skills? So this study this time comes from the Netherlands, where a group of researchers again looked at Korean adoptees. They had 29 adult adoptees from Korea and 29 native Dutch speakers, but here they split 
adult cheese into two groups. So one adopted as pre-linguistic infants, and another one adopted as toddlers and young children, ranging in age between one year and five months and five years and 10 months at the time of adoption. So they used again perception and production of phonemic contrast. So adoptive production scores improved significantly more across the training period than control participant score. But this is what is even more important. There was no significant difference between the two groups of adoptees, showing that even pre-linguistic inference had already you know, some memory traces for the language to which it, they were exposed while lying in the crib. So, but then, you know, we have two studies where the effect was not found, only two. But they are widely acknowledged in literature. Christopher Pallier, a French researcher, and his colleagues in 2003, they conducted a research again on Korean adopt adoptees in France. So they used fMRI uh, to see whether there is any activation, brain activation, depending on the language to which the participants were exposed. So they also used language recognition. Korean was placed in a group of uh, languages that were related to Korean, like the other Asian languages, or there was Polish, there was German, there were languages that were not uh, from the same family of languages. So they didn't find any difference in phonemic discrimination between adoptees and controls as far as brain activation. And so they suggested behavioral task may be better at detecting memory traces. Basically they said fMRI probably is not a good technique. You need to use some behavioral tasks. And they did exactly this. They published next year a study where Christopher Pallier was one of the researchers and so this time they had a relearning task on Korean adoptees in France, Switzerland, and Belgium. That was a different group of adoptees. Age at the time of adoption ranged between three and nine of years old, and half of, of uh, adoptees had no re-exposure to Korean since childhood. The other half had been re-exposed to Korean, 10 days or six months trip to Korea. No difference between adoptees and controls, regardless of the exposure. Those two studies actually attracted much attention among scholars working on memory traces and adoptees. Everybody acknowledged those two studies. Surprisingly, the, the group of researchers that did not find any effect, they never conducted an additional study either to you know, confirm their pr uh, prior findings or probably you know, to challenge their own earlier findings. So now results in those two studies were further challenged. Hiltenstam, a Swedish um, uh, researcher in 2009, he conducted a research again on Korean adoptees in Sweden, and uh, they were unexposed to Korean since their adoption for an average of 22 years. And formally, at the time of the study, they either formally studied Korean or they having studied it prior to the study. And adoptees had higher results on the VOT, which is voice onset time, phonemic discrimination task, than the group of native Swedish speakers who learned Korean as adults. However, adoptees underperformed native Swedish speakers on the grammaticality judgment. It shows that Swedish speakers who were learning Korean in a formal uh, classroom, they were much better in terms of acquiring grammar. So then, you know, the results were also confirmed by another study by, done by Park, where they had 21 Korean adoptees going through relearning of Korean, and perception of Korean sounds not present in Swedish was tested, and adoptees showed advantage in perception of Korean offspring. And they concluded that adoptees' early experience with Korean may have played a facilitating role. So now, in 2003, there was a new, uh, not, it was in 2016, I believe, a new fMRI study further challenging now results in Palier and et al. So last year, there was a study coming from Quebec. So Chinese adoptees in Quebec, and this is interesting because they were at the age of 9, 10 at the moment of testing. They were adopted at the, you know, at the time when they were just around one year old. And so they were compared with two groups. 
age-matched Chinese children of the same age who were uh, in uh, Canada with their parents, who immigrated with their parents, and were speaking Chinese at home, and age-matched French monolinguals who never were exposed to Chinese before. And the task was tonal discrimination task. So what they found, that there was similar brain activation in adoptees and Chinese L1 speakers, whereas both groups differed from a group of control French monolinguals. And it shows that uh, their results actually contradict the earliest results coming from Palier's study. So what they said is the similarity between adoptees and Chinese speakers clearly, uh, clearly illustrates that early acquired information is maintained in the brain and that early experience unconsciously influenced neural processing for years, if not indefinitely. So why do we have contradictory results? Two studies, no effect, the rest found the effect. Search for L1 memory traces, in, term, uh, in the words of Hilton-Sam, requires a methodological approach different from that pursued by Pallier and uh, Venturera. If there are remnants of seemingly lost L1, these are most likely not easily retrievable for the individual. It is reasonable to believe that a re-exposure to this language is necessary to boost accessibility. And so now we have a different approach. And this approach comes from an earlier psychological study promoted by Nelson, where he used word number pairs and learned them, and then, not he, but you know, he, uh, his participants, and then he found that there is a relearning advantage of old items over new items. Anything what you already learned is going to be easier for you to relearn rather than to learn new items. So for the first time, in studies uh, on language loss and language traces, uh, memory traces, was done by Case de Bock and Saskia Stausel in 2000. So they studied two siblings who were Dutch, who were German, I'm sorry, but they lived as children in the Netherlands, and since then they never spoke any Dutch. So they found that savings effect in those children. So how do you apply it? So first of all, you have to comply a set of L2 words the participants have almost certainly known in the past. And I want to make uh, sure that you understand that the studies that they were doing concerned only L2. And then I'll show how I adopted this paradigm and I use it for adoptees. So use the receptive cue test to assess which words are still known Present each L2 word for translation or naming or recognition. Remove the words that are still known from the original set. Select a subset of the unrecalled words, which, go, which are going to be old vocabulary. Compile a set of L2 words the participants have almost certainly not known in the past new vocabulary. With children, it's easy because you can go and find, you know, the data, uh, there is uh, the, the database on uh, what children of different ages know. And then training session. Mix old and new and present with L1 translation or pictures, whatever they do this, and uh, pay it associate paradigm, which is called in psychology. Then they use a distraction task and cute recall task of all the new words using L1 translations, and the savings effect is the difference between the recall scores for the old and new words. It reflects the amount of retained vocabulary. So savings paradigm was started on L2, and it showed consistently positive uh, results. Savings found for German in the US and French in the Netherlands. Savings for Korean or Japanese and missionaries. This one was, uh, that was one of the biggest studies because they had about, I think, 400 missionaries. So then recent study was done for French, especially for all the participants, there were savings in the Netherlands again. So the methodological differences between two approaches, saving studies versus savings paradigm studies. First, saving studies, they used control group. 
In settings paradigm studies, there was no control group. The control factor is actually the rate of uh, relearning of those old words versus learning new words. Saving studies were done both on L1 and L2. Remember, we had studies on adoptees and overhearers. Uh, and settings paradigm study was done only on L2. And here I was presented with a fascinating and absolutely unusual case. So she's three year old female born in the US. High school graduate, single mother, blue collar job. Moved from her family at the age of three, changed a few foster families, and was adopted by English speaking parents shortly after that. It was a close case adoption. She did not know from what linguistic or ethnic background she was coming. She spoke the language, according to her, she spoke the language different than English, and her adoptive parents claimed this as well. They did not know what the language was. In 2011, the participant was going through psychotherapy as a result of post-traumatic stress disorder not related to language issues. Her uh, psychiatrist uh, suggested that while she will be recollecting some episodes from her childhood, she may remember some language. So she recovered linguistic forms, no semantic meaning. So she remembered some words like friend, don't be afraid, English, coda, little rascal. But you know, those words that I'm giving you, they are in English already in translation. I'll tell you, you know, how I discovered what they were. She contacted the linguistic department at uh, the Ohio State. Someone apparently knows who answers the phone, the difference between languages, because she asked those language, uh, words in the language in which she recovered those uh, words. And they said, you know what, it sounds like Slavic. She called the Slavic department, and this is you know, the paradox how you can uh, you know, absolutely by chance find the most fascinating case to study. My office is on the third floor, my you know, main office is on the fourth. I go to check my mailbox only once when I'm on campus. That was the time when I stopped by the main office to check my mailbox, and I overheard our secretary talking to a front desk student who picked up the phone, and he was on the phone with this, with this woman. He said, you know, she forgot the language. What should I do? You know, now she remembered something. And I remember, you know, I just heard forget, forgot, someone forgot language. I just jumped out of that corner. I said, give me the phone. So this is how I got this study. So when presented with such an unusual case, what should one do? Because literature does not know any cases like this how to curb enthusiasm. That was my main issue, I think, when I started working on this. Because when you get overexcited about finding something as unusual as this, you don't really want your enthusiasm to get into your scholarly research. You have to calm yourself down and think straight and try you know, to approach this unusual case in the most scholarly manner. Do we know of any similar studies? No. How to design a study? Who knows? What are we looking for? Whom to discuss it with? And luckily, Case de Bot, the first who adopted the settings paradigm, is a close friend of mine. So I communicated with him via email. I said, Case, I'm getting this case. What should I do? He said, you don't have any approach to you know, access to MRI. And plus, MRI studies at that point were not very reliable results. And he said, why don't you try to adopt savings paradigm? But I, have, but I had really to you know, change a little bit. First of all, I decided to conduct a pretest to see what she knows. I asked her to put together a list of those words in English using you know, like, uh, English alphabet. So she came with that uh, list of words. And I tried to decipher the list. So there were 40. I would say blends, because sometimes they sounded like preposition with the noun together. Because you have to remember she was three years old. She didn't, she doesn't, didn't know the difference between you know, grammatical categories. Most of those words started with the repetitive ke, ge, and be consonants, and many had the repetitive ending r, which is or the suffix k or ka. 
In consultation with experts in Bulgarian, Slovak, Czech, Serbo Croatian, and Polish, the above languages were eliminated as possible kind of candidates. But there were two candidates that still remained on the list, Russian and Ukrainian. And there is an issue here to separate the two because there is a big overlap in vocabulary. So most uh, Russians, I think, they don't have any problem to understand Ukrainian because uh, vocabulary is very similar. In first session, I decided to see whether she can recognize anything like lullabies. I was singing lullabies to her. I was giving her the count of numbers from one to two. I asked her days of the week, like Monday, Friday, and uh, she exclaimed, yes, I remember this word, Friday, and Friday is Pyatnitsa. You can understand it's not cognate. Uh, Saturday is a little bit uh, controversial because Saturday is Subota in Russian, so you know, it can be considered partial cognate. So we know that uh, we have this, uh, uh, phenomenon known as infantile amnesia. The children do not have any autobiographical memories until the age of probably two, three, not uh, uh, earlier. And so it is co considered to be linked with two different things, with language development and also with uh, the development of identity uh, when children become, uh, realize that uh, they have the sense of self. So also, uh, it was found that direct retrieval of distant autobiographical memories is most evident in cases of post-traumatic stress disorder, and it was reported in studies. So I tried to somehow to elicit autobiographical memories, giving her keywords. You know, when you think about this word, like toy, and I would use this word in Russian, do you have any memories? But she could not, you know, elicit any memories. So then, session number two, I decided to see whether she can recognize some pictures. I used some pictures known to children, you know, of her of three years of age, and so eight words were recognized. So basically, she was looking at those pictures, and I was saying those word in, words in Russian, you know, kravatka, gulat, idi, stan, and so those words, and she was, you know, pointing to those. Uh, pictures where, you know, that were matching. So I removed those words from, from later testing. So I reconstructed 24 words from the earlier retrieved words. Five words recognized partially, the, the rest fully and no semantic meaning. Cute ta recall task based on the repetitive prefixes from the earlier re uh, retrieved list, same words, often in the same corrupted, as I call, form. So the question of, is it Russian or Ukrainian? So I tried to produce this phonological repetition task, uh, asking her to repeat after me one of the most difficult sounds, which is affricate in Russian with a sh sound, like shuka, shotka. Non-native speakers of Russian have usually problem to learn this sound. She had no problem to repeat it after me. Then I tried to produce Ukrainian glottal kh, which I'm not you know, probably good at because I can claim that uh, I produced it correctly. But you know, she, did, uh, she, also, she didn't have uh, you know, as easy, I think, you know, way to repeat that sound. So again, you know, I tried to do the same word matching task both in English, um, both in Russian and Ukrainian. I was uh, consulted by Ukrainian speakers, so you know, I knew how all those words to articulate in Ukrainian. So there were inconclusive results of pretest, and there was, there was a decision to proceed with the savings paradigm and use stimuli that are cognates in Russian and Ukrainian. So only those words that overlap in both languages, because maybe I will never know whether it was either of those two, but at least I have to eliminate the, you know, this possibility that I will be priming one language more than another. So then there was a question, what does a three-year-old know? And so here we know that there is a limited vocabulary for a three-year-old child, and as we don't know in which uh, language she was speaking, but we know that she was born in the U.S., I decided to proceed with translation equivalents of the database that we have available for English-speaking children. 
And so this is a database which, uh, you know, has uh, all this information about the uh, words known uh, by, you know, certain age. So old words in my, you know, hypothesis were those known by 90% of 30 month old children. That was the oldest information that you can get, you know, from that old database. And new from 0 to 45%. Okay, later there was another database uh, published, but it came already when the study was completed. There were discrepancies between the two sources and new words, but both are consistent on old words. I double checked those two. So altogether there were 72 words, 36 old and 36 new used in the study, and morphological complexity was counterbalanced, no difficult sounds. So, the savings paradigm was adopted, pre-test, post-test, delayed post-test. There were six sessions. I was mostly interested in delayed post-test, whether she remembers those words. Stimuli, the cards depicting objects and uh, actions. And the words were learned until all were either recalled or recognized in immediate post-test. Word picture matching task recognition was offered only for those words that were not recalled in picture naming task. And so delayed post-test and recognition were conducted exactly a week later. Okay, so for some reason I have repetition. Okay, so this is how it was done. So, you know, in the sessions uh, three, four, five, and six, I conducted the savings paradigm, exactly one week separating each session from another. And then, why did I use control group? Because in this study on savings paradigm, no control groups were, were used. But because I wanted to eliminate any criticism that old words can be easier to learn than you know, uh, old words, than new words for the child. And so that's why we conducted uh, a control um, study. And so participants were 12 female participants coming from Louisiana State University where my co-author invited her at this point to become my co-author. She ran that study for me. So the materials were the same. The task, same task as in the case study. The only difference was that she used PowerPoint because she wanted to have reaction time measurement and that was more control. So prediction. No significant differences should emerge for accuracy or reaction times between old and new words for control. So my predictions were, if the participant shows the relearning effect for the old words over the new words in delayed post-test, we can conclude that one of the languages identified through the pre-test could be a lost language. If no effect is found, we may suggest that traces of memory for the lost language in such a young subject are so minimal if they exist at all that the savings paradigm technique cannot be used effectively to answer our question, or the lost language was not one of the two languages identified as possible candidates. If controls show preference for the old words, we may suggest that those words are just inherently easier to learn. So now we have uh, uh, comparison, and uh, unfortunately the colors are not so uh, so the darker ones here are new words and the lighter one old words. We can see that uh, at least for the first two sessions in case study we have a very clear preference for old words and there is no difference in for the control group. On the contrary, for first session they preferred for some reason new words over old words. So they were much better in remembering those. So recognition. Here we also have, you know, just uh, uh, recognition actually was very interesting to see for control group where there was a preference for new words, but not, you know, for uh, old words. So we can see that here, you know, it's not very inconclusive, but case study recognition was done only on those words that she did not recall. The numbers by themselves were very minimal. So that's why, you know, we cannot probably, you know, even interpret the findings on case study because the recall is more kind of representative because most words were recalled and only on those few that she did not recall, you know, she was tested in recognition. 
So the study looked at the unique case of a childhood language loss with many unknown factors involved. The savings paradigm was employed and reconceptualized, more focused on repetitive re-exposure and delayed post-test. The results of the delayed recognition post-test indicated that the rate of retention of old words was higher than that of new words, and the combination of the pre-test results and delayed post-test results suggested that either Russian or Ukrainian could indeed be a lost childhood language. The study demonstrated how psycholinguistic techniques can be used outside the lab setting in order to tap into cases of pervasive language loss and adaptive. Of course, there were numerous limitations, unknown background of the participant. The vocabulary set was based on Russian-Ukrainian cognates. A third unrelated language could not be added due to participants' reluctance to continue with this study and lack of sufficient vocabulary outside the limited number of words known by a three-year-old child. So any language tested further would be relying on the same vocabulary and she would already have some kind of interference from the other languages in which she was tested. So better learning strategies developed over the six sessions could confound the results. And much interference, okay, as I said, you know, can be already found. This paper was uh, published and it was recognized by the board of directors as the most outstanding paper. And I believe it's just because it was such an unusual subject uh, you know, that uh, literature does not know many cases like this. Thank you for your attention and I'm willing to answer your questions. Yes, Laura. Uh, we could do, but again, you know, when you conduct, for example, a session in Russian, and then you conduct a session using this, because, you know, the, the number of words is really very limited. It's limited, because three-year-old children don't know that much if you go to this, you know, database. So you would already prime her, because she will be probably improving learning those words, you know, in another language. That was, you know, I think if she were, you know, older, then it could be split at least. Mm -hmm. Yes. language? I didn't think so, no, you know, but that would be really interesting because this girl uh, on whom I based my dissertation study, this, you know, who was adopted at the age of nine, the last time when I talked to her parents, she was going through adolescence and she was having serious issues. She was uh, in, uh, uh, you know, how was she called? work with shrink. You know, I'm trying to find a scientific term for this. <laughs> yes, therapy. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> she was in therapy, and uh, at that point, parents even considered, you know, just giving up on her. You know, she, they said that she started having some flashback memories about abuse in the orphanage from where she was coming, and so it's not surprising that, you know, at the time when they go through adolescence, those problems can be you know, exacerbate. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much again for your attendance.